always have a text. Well, you know, I have a lot of scripture in my message, but I failed to have a text. So we don't have nothing to read tonight to start the message. So I figured we'd just go to the Lord and pray, pray that he would bless it. And then uh, we'll just kind of get the word in there throughout the message. That's okay. Amen. Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray that you will bless the word tonight, bless our hearts to hear, God, that somebody can be ministered to, touched, and changed tonight, God, that's what church is all about, God, it's about change, that when I come to church, I'm different, Lord, when I leave, my life has been changed by your power, your word, your spirit, Lord, and God, I just pray that you would anoint our lips of clay tonight, in Jesus' name, amen, why don't you turn to your neighbor and tell him you're glad to have him in the house of the Lord. That's the only problem with Wednesday night. Sometimes you got some long distance neighbors. <laughs> but that's all right. We're getting there. Amen. And I wanted to talk to you tonight about the extraordinary power of ordinary giving. And when we think about giving, usually we think of monetary giving. And uh, the way we treat our money is no doubt very important to the Lord. Matter of fact, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of scriptures that deal with our money and our giving and our stewardship. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, For there where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I find this interesting that Jesus chose to word the scripture this way. Because I would have thought that it would have been the other way around. I would have thought where my heart is, there will my treasure be. I would have thought that our treasure would have followed our heart. You know, if you like cars, you would spend money on cars. If you like shoes, you'd spend money on shoes. If you like sports, you'd spend money on sports. But Jesus said it's the other way around. He said where your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to go. The word treasure here means an accumulation of valuable assets. And so I guess what Jesus was saying is that what you continue over a period of time to invest your time, your money, your energy into, that is what will control your heart eventually. It will become the most important thing to you. So there is a definite relationship between our heart and our money and our resources. That's why investing in the kingdom of God is so important. Investing in the kingdom of God connects my heart to the purpose and to the work of God. I become a partner in business with Jesus of his business of reaching a lost world. Someone said, if you want to know what a man loves, look at his checkbook. Now, evidently, this is an old-timey saying because I don't think too many people use checkbooks anymore. Uh, matter of fact, I went to the bank the other day and was, oh, Brother David still does. <laughs> he said he will take a check after church. Uh, and I talked to the lady, and, and it was, I was opening a checking account. Sorry, Sister Brenda. And she, I asked her, I said, well, what about the checks? I don't use checks very often, but I just, you know, figure it was a good question. And she said, well, we don't really... She said, you can order them if you'd like to. She said, but most people don't order checks anymore. She said, if you need a few, just come in and we'll print you some. She said, they look exactly like real checks. She was like, and we can give you four or five at a time. So evidently, this is an old saying, uh, if you use checks, God bless you. And uh, Sister Brenda will take as many of those as you would like to give after church if you're trying to get rid of your checks. Another person said, when the heart is converted, the purse will be inverted. I like that one. <laughs> Reverend Ike, I know probably half of you don't know who Reverend Ike is, but Reverend Ike used to say the lack of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> but Malachi probably says it best. Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering? An offering is something given from that which belongs to me. That's what an offering is. Now, tithe does not belong to you. If you didn't know that, tithe wasn't yours to begin with. Tithe is just something that you're able to give back to the Lord, which was already his. Offerings are what we feel like we can afford to give above the tithes which belong to God. That's where the sacrifice comes in. And sacrifice is not a sacrifice until it really costs me something. Some people think sacrifice is given out of my abundance. Well, really, sacrifice is giving out of the little things that I have. That's why the widow's might was so important is because it was a sacrifice because she gave when she didn't have anything to give. 
Many times, though, the amount we have to offer an offering to us seems so small and so ordinary and so insignificant that we just think, man, what good is that going to do? I mean, you know, after I pay my tithes and all this kind of stuff, I can only give $10 a month. Or I can only give $10 a month towards uh, revival. Or I can only give $10 a month towards education fund. Or I can only give $5 a paycheck to men's ministry or ladies' ministry or a music ministry. But the beautiful thing about giving in the kingdom of God is not the monetary value. It's the sacrificial value. That's how the Lord values things. And the act of investing your treasure in a place where you want your heart to be is what's important. When I give to the kingdom of God, regardless of the numerical value, it is an investment I'm making in a place that I desire my heart to go. The gift of five loaves and two fishes was so ordinary, especially under the circumstances. But the monetary or numerical value of the gift was not important. It was the act of somebody offering to Jesus something that they treasured that set the miracle into motion. God isn't looking for wealthy givers. God is looking for sacrificial givers. And throughout the scripture, we see the Lord bless those who are willing to surrender what they have no matter how ordinary it seems to be to them. And ultimately, it seems that overall, he just doesn't like stingy people. Because we find this exchange in the book of Haggai, chapter 1. Shortly after that, God said more to Haggai and spoke it. How is it that it's the right time for you to live in your fine new homes while the home of God's temple is in ruins? And then a little later, take a good hard look at your life. Think it over. You have spent a lot of money, but you don't have much to show for it. You keep filling your plates, but you never get filled up. You keep drinking and drinking and drinking, but you're always thirsty. You put on a layer after layer of clothes, but you just can't get warm. And the people who work for you, what are they getting out of it? Not much. A leaky, rusted out bucket. That's what. Take a good, hard look at your life. Think it over. Then God said, here's what I want you to do. Climb into the hills and cut some timber. Bring it down and rebuild the temple. Do it just for me. Honor me. You've had great ambitions for yourself, but nothing has come of it. The little you have brought to my temple, I've blown away. There was nothing to it. And why? Because while you've run around caught up in the taking care of your own houses, my home is in ruins. That's why. Because of your stinginess. And so, I, and so I've given you a dry summer and a skimpy crop. I've matched your tight-fisted stinginess by decreeing a season of drought, drying up the fields and the hills, withering the gardens and archers, stunting the vegetables' growth. Nothing, not man or woman, nor animal or crop, is going to thrive. Man, that is harsh. Now, I don't think there's any stingy people here tonight. But I just said all that to show you that the Lord, it is imparted to him how we utilize the resources that he gives us. And that he gets really upset when we hold back the thing that he gave to us in the first place. Because however you give is how he will give back. That's proven out in the word of God. 2 Corinthians 9 and 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. But the principle of giving, and I hope you don't miss the point here. If you're just thinking about money, you're missing the point. The principle of giving isn't just limited to our finances and the money that we make. His desire for us to give our ordinary to him transcends all of the things that we have, all of our resources. In Exodus, we find Moses, who probably is one of the most ordinary, non-talented, non-self-assured, afraid, limited characters in the Bible. I mean, if anybody had problems that would have counted him out from being used by God, it was Moses. Moses had a mountain to overcome to be used by God. Exodus 4.1, And Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. Now in those days, a rod wasn't like a walking stick. A rod was highly individualized. 
It even was used many times to identify a person. Kind of like, just think of it as your driver's license. Moses' rod was his driver's license. So not only was Moses ordinary, I mean, you know, he had nothing going for him. Not only was he ordinary, when the Lord asked him about his rod, he said, it's a rod. He didn't use any descriptive terms. He didn't say, it's my cherry wood rod or my solid oak rod or my varnished new uh, hand-carved rod. It's not my signed Pharaoh the Fifth stainless steel limited edition rod, only three of ten that were made in Egypt, no doubt. No, it was just an ordinary, nondescript, run-of-the-mill rod. Moses wasn't proud of it. It wasn't valuable to him. It wasn't rare. It was simply ordinary. But between verse 2 and verse 20, something changes. Because in verse 20, he refers to it as the rod of God. Now, that's quite a step. I mean, that's quite a huge leap in descriptive terms. From being nothing to the rod of God. From being, I'm just Joe Blow Lyson number to, yeah, I am the King of kings and the Lord of I am Jesus Christ. That is quite a big difference in descriptive terms there. So what changed? This nondescript wood, this personal property of his, what happened? The rod was still the same. It hadn't changed. But what had changed was that Moses got willing to give it to the Lord. He gave control of his ordinary unto God. And we see in verse 3 that the Lord asked Moses, what is in thine hand? And when he tells him that it's just an ordinary rod, the Lord says, throw it down. Or in other words, give it to me. But Lord, it's just a rod. It's just an ordinary old rod. You don't want this. I mean, you could find a lot nicer rods in other places. Other men carry a lot nicer rods. There are rods out there that Lord, no doubt, are much more well equipped. And it's not so much what we have in our walk with God. It is what our heart is willing to give unto him. It's when we are willing to give of our, what we feel, smallness unto the Lord so that he can use it. But Lord, my life's so ordinary. I'm nothing special. I don't have any special talents or abilities. I've got a messed up past. Lord, I'm not talkative. I'm not creative. There's other people in the church that are more versed in the word of God and in doctrine and more outgoing. Blah, 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 blah. 1 Corinthians 1 and 27 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught those that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Sounds like he's talking about a lot of ordinary things here. And many times we're waiting to be endued with some special attribute out of God's magical toolbox in heaven before we allow God to step into our lives and use us. When God is saying, if you will just give me what you have, I am able. I know everything you are. I know all of your shortcomings. I know all of the things that you're not. But my desire is for you to just yield it to me. Now, the moment that the rod left Moses' fingertips, it turned into a serpent. The moment that it left the fingertips of Moses, it became the property of God. And something powerful happened with it. You see, when Moses took his ordinary and obeyed God, it became extraordinary. I mean, to go from a rod to a serpent is extraordinary. And the moment we release our ordinary unto God. God is going to take it. And when he gets his hands on it, it will become extraordinary. But Lord, my faith is kind of shaky. It's not, you know, what it should be. It was the ordinary faith of a father that brought deliverance to his son in Mark chapter 9, verse 23. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Wait a minute. That doesn't sound like the great faith of the lady in, Mark, in Luke chapter 7. Sounds like just ordinary old run-of-the-mill faith. But when he placed it into the hands of Jesus, it became extraordinary. Because verse 25 says, Jesus said unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. His ordinary became extraordinary. The miracle had just as much to do with faith 
as it did a willingness to give unto the Lord what he had. You said, Jesus, Jesus said, if you can give me your less than great belief, I will give you a miracle. Moses was just an ordinary man who obeyed God. Because so much of the kingdom of God comes down to obedience. You know, if you look through the Bible many, many times, it's not the what, it's the why. It's not what anybody did for the Lord. It's not what anybody gave to the Lord. It's not what anybody maybe surrendered that a great miracle. It was just why. Do it because I ask you to. Do it because the Lord asked me to do it. But what about the parting of the Red Sea? God did it. Moses didn't do it. What about the Ten Commandments? God did it through Moses. The water that came from the rock, it was God. It was a God thing. You see, Moses was willing to offer his ordinary so that God could show himself extraordinary through Moses. So after Moses throws down his rod and it becomes a serpent, the Lord says, pick it back up, Moses. And when he did, it was the same old rod. Now, you know Moses had to be disappointed. Moses had, I mean, it wasn't diamond studded. It didn't have like some accessories that came with it. It wasn't stamped, you know, God's rod or, you know, used by, by the Lord or, you know, did a great miracle with this or, or formerly a serpent. I mean, nothing like that was inscribed. It was just the same old ordinary rod. So Moses wasn't able to capitalize on this miracle, really. I mean, but maybe the Lord knew that. Maybe the Lord knew, you know, if Moses had gotten some special, he might have got the big head. He might have wanted some new duds to go with his new rod, and he might have wanted an entourage and all of this kind of stuff. And it would have become more about Moses than what the Lord, what was important to the Lord, and that was the ordinariness of the rod. That was the willingness for Moses to give the Lord something that to everybody else was just mundane and ordinary. And so giving our ordinary isn't about us getting blessed, even though he promised in Luke 6 and 38, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. It is about investing in the kingdom of God. It's about investing in something where that I desire that my heart lives, that my heart ends up. And as we stand tonight... The kingdom of God is all about transfer of resources. When we come to God, God gives us things and some things we are born with. But what, what is important about moving up in the kingdom of God, what's important about getting closer to God is always that transfer of resources. It's that giving of what I have in exchange for what he will do through me. You know, I guess ultimately the Lord chooses to use us but I guess if he had a changed his plan he really honestly could have done it all probably without us and it, it really is if we think about it a privilege that the Lord wants something from me I don't think the Lord needs anything from me he genuinely wants something from me isn't that amazing that the creator of the universe, the God that can speak anything into existence. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't lack anything. And yet there is something in his heart that says, I would like that. And you say this, I mean, this is ordinary. This is nothing. This is, I even am ashamed of this. I even am ashamed to say that I would give this unto the Lord. But the Lord says, you know, I think I treasure that. I think I'd like to have that. That should just sit us in awe that God would choose to have a part of me that even by my own account and my own value system is just ordinary. 1 Corinthians 1 and 26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Ordinary is the extraordinary secret to the power and the blessing of God. It's ordinary people giving ordinary things to an extraordinary God who's going to use them to do an extraordinary work. His desires for us is that we trust Him enough to invest what we have in what He's doing. Our heart follows our treasure. And so sometimes I have to evaluate my life and find out where is my treasure. And the way that you find where your treasure is, is 
Where does most of my time go? Where does most of my energy go? Where does most of my money go? Where does most of my thought go? That's where my treasure is. And if all of those things are tied up in things that are not of God or things that are in the world, things that are not kingdom related, then eventually my heart will be there. My heart might not be there right now. And you say, I'm doing fine. I mean, I think I've got my priorities right. I still come to church all the time that I ought to. I go to the prayer rooms. But the Bible says that eventually your heart will be there. Wherever I lay up my treasure, wherever I lay up my time, my energy, my resources, my heart's going there. My heart's pointed there. And eventually it will end up there. There is no way that I can spend all of my energy and my efforts on things that are not kingdom related and still make it to heaven. It's not going to happen. Because my heart is what's going to be revealed on judgment day. When I stand before God, I'm not going to stand there with all of my stuff. I'm going to stand there with my heart. And that's what God's going to judge. God's going to judge what was the state of your heart. You say, well, Lord, I live for you. I went to church. I, I did all the things. I believed the doctrine. He was like, I know, but there's no investment in that. All your investment's over here. I was looking for your treasure, and I was hoping it would be here. But it's not. It's nowhere to be found. It's in other things. It's in things that consumed your time and your energy. So I thought it'd be good. We have plenty of time. I think it'd be good just as a church if we came down and just kind of had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. Lord, just help me evaluate myself doesn't mean I'm lost or anything but sometimes I just need a course correction sometimes I just you know I'm spending too much time in that area I'm spending too much resources in that area even though we come to church and we hear the Word of God sometimes we just have to get that course correction so could we do that as a church why don't we come down and and gather around the altar for just a few moments and then you can be dismissed and Lord that you could just touch our hearts